and loving Father, we thank you, dear Lord, that we can uh, gather here together, Father. We thank you for our, our church. We thank you for what we can celebrate today and observe today. We pray for little Beckham, dear God, that you would watch over him and bless him, the whole family, dear Lord. Father, we just lift up before you all the young children, dear God, in our, in our congregation, Lord, we are so blessed. And we just pray for them, dear Lord, and just ask that you would watch over them, protect them, just work in their heart, make them into young men and young women of faith, and uh, continue to draw them to yourself. We pray in Jesus' name for his sake. Amen. You've heard the term, drain the swamp. And before you get all crazy, uh, it's what we see here in this text. This text is about corruption in high places versus a man, a simple man, Joseph, and his betrothed wife and their little baby. You know, we want to, each of us wants to make a difference in the world. And I think in particular, you know, as, as young people grow up and, and uh, start making their way in this life, there's a sense, and, and we all have it, and it's, it's, it's a good thing, it's a normal thing, that, that we want to make a difference. We want to think that our lives matter, rather than to be just an anonymous person, an anonymous name, anonymous Somebody, we want to think that we can make a difference. But we also realize, as this text brings out to us, as the darkness encroaches over the landscape, the Josephs of this world and their obedience to God puts them in front and center in the action. So you want to be, you want to make a difference. You want to make a difference in your life in this dark world of encroaching darkness. Take a lesson from Joseph. It's kind of neat. I didn't really realize this, but you know, last was it last Sunday we talked about or was that Christmas Day? I can't. I mean, I get mixed up. <clears throat> but anyway, we talked about Joseph within one of the last two messages from here, and it was a blessing. It was really interesting to look at. His obedience. And, you know, we don't hear from him. You know, he, he's, he's a man of few words. He's a man of few words, but, but he's a man that, that we, we learn, we learn some characteristics. One man, his wife, and their little child, King. Their little child, King, were protected by a heavenly messenger. As we look at this text here, you, 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 and please open up your Bibles and, and, and follow along and, and uh, check me and correct me and, and so on. Um, when, you, when you look at verse 13 of, of chapter 2, and just to get your bearings, uh, Matthew chapter 2, of course, is the story of, of what we call the wise men from the east. Is what it, like my heading in my Bible for chapter 2. Uh, we, we looked at the text, I believe it was last Sunday actually, of, of verse 18 and, and through 25 about Joseph. And, uh, and, and so the wise men had just left. That's what verse 13 says. Now when they had departed, with the, the, the they is, is the wise men. And, and you look at verse 12, the previous verse, you back up one verse. Then being divinely warned in the dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country in another way. So they were warned in a dream not to go back, because that was the arrangement. See, they, they didn't know to go to Bethlehem. This is my take on this saying, as I've like, studied this over the years, and as I preached on it. I preached on it here, uh, you know, my Matthew 2 sermon. And, and we all know the story of the wise men, and, and, and it took place sometime after the, the manger, the, the birth of Christ. So the wise men show up, could have been up to two years later. We don't know. I commentated that I looked at, you know, just doing reference on this one, was saying it might have been six months later. So, so anyway, anyway a little, there's a space there. Because it says they were in a house. They, they wouldn't stay in a manger. They wouldn't stay in a stable. 
right for more than one night, they quickly, as soon as they could, try to find a new place to live. That makes perfect sense. So they found a more permanent dwelling, and, and so that's, that's where we see there. And so Mary and Joseph, the wise men had just left, they're all excited and still wondering what's going on, and they finally fall off to sleep. And all of a sudden, Joseph has another dream. The wise men had just departed from their blessed visitation, and they too were warned in the dream not to return to Herod. So the angels were busy. Ever notice how busy the angels were in and around Jesus' birth, as well as his life and, and death, even all the way to his ascension? The angel was standing there as, at, at his resurrection. The, the angel or angels were, were in the tomb, and, 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 and even, you know, just all these different things. All these different uh, appearances of angels. Do you believe in angels? What are angels? I'm not going to get into that, but those are some interesting questions to tease you with. And you can look into that. You know, it, it's, 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 it's interesting. In, in seminary, some of the things we talked about, I still remember some 30-some years after the fact. You know, I, I, I brought up about angels and and, and, you know, there's always a concern that, that some seminary student's going to go wrong and, and going to get an unhealthy balance or an unhealthy interest in, in, in something and go off on a tangent, you know. And angels are a good example of that. A person could go off on a tangent on, on angels. And, and, and angels be, can become the focal point, and, and they're, they're really not supposed to be the focal point. The Bible says that we're going to judge angels. So we're actually above angels. John is, spends a lot of time with an angel in the book of Revelation, doesn't he? And he actually, he actually bows down to that angel on a couple occasions. I didn't realize it was more than once. I know it was once in Revelation, but I didn't realize it was more than once that John bows down. And each time, you know what the angel said? He says, do not bow down to me. For I'm your fellow brother, or something like that. I'm here, I'm, I'm, I'm here to, to help you. I, I'm not above you in any way. But angels are very powerful. And the angels are very, very busy. So you can see that this is pretty much a history. And, and it's, it's, it's just an interesting narrative. And, and, and as, as a sermon and so on, I was thinking, well, what in the world can I share from this? It's just an interesting story. What, what can I, what, what, how many... What can I share from this other than just, just tell the story? Um, and, and I think that we can learn some things. And, and the first thing that we can learn is that wherever you are now, God calls you back to the land, your place. Verse 13, you see there, now when they had departed, behold, the angel of the Lord said to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise. Take the young child and his mother and flee to Egypt and stay there until I bring you word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. And then when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I have called my son. You know, Matthew, of course, is the one who loves to remind the reader that there is fulfillment of Scripture. That it might be fulfilled. That it might be fulfilled. Matthew is just very, very almost tedious in reminding us that, that something that took place was a fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy. And that's exactly what it is. So what's the significance about Jesus going back to Egypt? Or Jesus going down to Egypt. Mary and Joseph trekking down there was a several day journey. So once again, they have to hop on the, hop on the donkey. And hit the road. It wasn't a minivan. And, and, and take off down for Egypt, another journey. Perhaps longer than even to Bethlehem. And, and, and so there they go. And they stay there. And, and, and the angel gave him specific instruction. He says, and stay there until I tell you. Verse 13. Until I bring you word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. But it's important, it says, out of Egypt I have called my son. What's the significance of that? Why didn't Jesus just stay in Egypt? Well, God called him back to Egypt. God called Abraham back to, back to the Holy Land. He, he gave him the Holy Land. 
God called and went to Abraham in the book of Genesis, and, and he gave him this land. But then Abraham also had to head down to Egypt because of a famine. Remember that? He lied and said Sarah was his sister and so on. A whole scandal one of the crises in Abraham's life. And then, and then we also know that as, as, a, as a sanctuary, Egypt was a sanctuary for God's people. Also, Joseph and so on, they had ended up in Egypt. You know all that story about Joseph and his 12 sons and so on. So they all ended up down in Egypt. And they were there for 400 years and became enslaved. And God called them back. God called Abraham back. God called the nation of Israel back as the firstborn as he called Mary and Joseph, and the baby back. And God is calling you back as well. So wherever you are, God calls you back to the land. God calls you back to the land. Your place, as it were, and where God wants you are important. And that's why God is maybe calling you back to a certain place place in your life, a certain, a certain place where you were following Him. Maybe it was a, as a child, as a youth, you were so dedicated to the Lord, God is calling you back to the land. Maybe you've strayed from the church, you've strayed from God and His Word, and, and, and God is calling you back. Out of Egypt I have called my son, he says. So the first thing in, this, in making a difference in, in, in this dark world that we live in full of corruption is that God is calling you back to the land. You and I need to get back into the land. The second thing is don't ever doubt or get used to the pervasive evil. Darkness is a default characteristic of the world that we live in. You spend time any place outside of the, the, the Word of God and, and the, the fellowship of the saints, and even sometimes here we, we, we struggle and we, we have our weaknesses, but basically you spend any time, you're spending time in the dark world of corruption. Don't get used to it. Don't get used to corruption. There's a reason why lights are turned off in sinful places. There's a reason why there's no windows in a lot of places of ill recruit. They don't, the, the darkness hates the light. It's the reason why Herod was chasing his baby all over the kingdom come. Darkness hates the light. God permits darkness to hold sway. And we'll see that in the next point here. So the obedient can work. God permits darkness to hold sway. So the obedient can work and do what they need to do. So don't ever doubt or get used to the pervasive evil and the darkness that encroaches over the landscape. It reminds me of another person that did, Lot, decided that he was going to move towards the plains of Sodom. And you notice it says he did not move to Sodom, but he moved to the plains. And all of us have that inclination to move to the plains of Sodom. And the next time we find Lot, it says he's living outside the city. And the third time we meet Lot, he's living inside the city of Sodom. And you see the progression there. Don't ever get used to the progression of darkness. Because it draws us all over. There's a little Lot in each and every one of us. And we make the excuse, oh, I just want to live in the cities of the plain. It's well watered and will feed my flocks and herds. I've got the greatest excuse in the book. If you turn around and Lot is living luxuriously and lavishly within the city. And sin is rampant all around him. And his children are running around on the streets. Well, thirdly, the baby in the manger is a threat. Is all, the baby in the manger is always a threat. Let's get to know these Herods a little bit. I was confused about the Herods, and rightly so. It's just really easy to get confused about all these Herods. Remember, I was talking about John the Baptist a few Sundays ago, and I, and I couldn't remember which Herod he had offended. Because remember, John the Baptist didn't make anybody mad because of his preaching down at the river. He was preaching against the religious hypocrites at that made them mad, but that wasn't going to cause any problem. But when he started meddling in the 
personal sexual life of the Herod, that's when he tripped the line, he went too far. And Herod's, well, let's see, I'll tell you in a minute here, the, the Herodias got, got angry with him and said, get rid of that John the Baptist guy, he's making me mad. Well, who was this? Well, this is Herod the Great. In, in this Christmas story, we are meeting and we are dealing with Herod the Great. He's got four uh, uh, offspring, Archelaus, which was mentioned in the text here, Antipas, are his sons, and then he's got a daughter, Salome. And so what is a tetrarchy? You've heard that term in there. Well, it's just it's nothing magical about that term. It's just, it's just he divided his kingdom into four quarters, four quadrants, and he gave each, quad, each son a quadrant, or each one of his children a quadrant. So Archelaus had one quadrant, Antipas had another quadrant, Philip, and so on. So it's Philip that, that was married to Herodias, and, and she was kind of a niece, to all of these people, and so she was the niece, she was also the wife, and you just get the whole picture here going on here. And so when I talk about the encroaching darkness, this is the sewer, this is the swamp that, that the people are, are living in and navigating and trying to get through. And that Jesus was born into the middle of this melee. That's why John the Baptist had in trouble. Well, in Matthew 14, 1, you can look this, you know, I, I just got too much information for the time we got here, but, but basically I think you get the idea. So even in, even in the book of Acts, you have the third or the fourth generation when Paul is in Acts 25 talking to Herod Agrippa. That's, that's, uh, that's the, the, the great-grandson of, of Herod the Great, who we have right here in this text. Well, anyway, that's enough of that. You get the idea. The baby in the manger is a threat. It's always a threat to the encroaching darkness and the swamp that, 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 that existed in this time. Christ and his followers are a threat to this corrupt family for several generations, all the way through to the Apostle Paul. With a pain in their side. And the baby is a manger and is a threat. And he was hated then and he's still hated now. Fourthly, obedience is critical. <coughs> Joseph's life is a textbook case of quiet, persistence, obedience to God. Unquestioned. You want to make a difference in this world, be obedient to God. It's very simple. And the and, and, and same goes to me. And I struggle with that. I, I struggle that you struggle with that. We all struggle with being obedient. But you know, like I said before, obedience feels good. It just feels good to be obedient to God. You, you, you might cause, you might make other people mad at you, you might make other people angry at you for being obedient to God, but you're going to make one person very, very happy, and that's all that matters. You're out to please one person, and I'm out to please one person. That's my heavenly father. And as soon as I leave here, I know I'll probably mess up and, and fall flat on my face, as you will fall flat on your face. But get right back up. Failure is not final. Failure is not defining you. Get up off your face. If you've fallen, dust off your coat, straighten your shirt, and just start walking again in a week. Don't let it define you. Get back in the game. You know, it's like if you go and shoot, shoot a basket in the wrong basket, what do you do? You just hang your head and go sit on a bench and cry and weep and everything. No, you got to get back. you got to get, get back on the court and start playing the game. Be a team member. And that's the way it is with us. We all fall. We all fail. Ever wonder why the powerful angelic host were only used to speak to Joseph in a dream instead of pulverizing Herod's Eden? You ever think of that? These powerful angels were not used the way the word Jesus said on, on the cross, or before he went to the cross, do you not think that I cannot call 10,000 angels to destroy the world? God wants us to be obedient. Doesn't make sense. But he wants you and I to be obedient and follow him. Is this a moralistic message? Am I just telling you to go there? Give it your best shot? Be obedient? No. I mean, the 
gospel here is Christ. And Christ is our loving Savior, who has saved us, who has redeemed us, who has, who has canceled all of our sins, enables us to go forth in obedience and service to Him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you, dear Lord, that we can be obedient. Lord, help us, O oh God, to learn from this, this quiet man, Joseph, that, that fades into oblivion. We see him one more time in the Gospels, if, I, if my comment is correct. Only one more time. And it's only it's, it's in a more or less incidental position. But Lord, that's okay. And if our if we fade into oblivion, that's okay too, as long as we're obedient as we go. Lord Jesus, help us and strengthen us in that way, in that regard. As we ourselves, as we too live in the dark and corrupt world. The names have changed. We're not we're not fighting Herods anymore, but we're fighting other people with other names. So dear God, strengthen us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.